welcome to Make Shit Happen. Our guest today is Dusty Stavs. Dusty has worked for 30 years in as, as a consultant. He has worked with executives, families, and community, as well as private and public companies. Dusty, uh, Dusty is also an author of three books, The Heart of Leadership, The Seven X Acts of Courage, and in mid-2013, he co-authored with Wayne Gerber, for call, it's called Dynamic Focus, Creating Significance and Breaking the Spells of Limitation, as well as over 250 articles, mostly in the Business Journal. Great accomplishment. Thank you, Dusty, for joining us today from the great state of North Carolina. Uh, well, thank you. Thank, and because thank of, you, Sam. We thank, our, we thank everybody to be in the virtual world now. It is a virtual world. It's very interesting. My work over the past four decades has been face-to-face -face with individuals, with teams, with organizations, in airplanes, traveling everywhere. And the past three and a half months has been, all contact has been via Zoom or uh, through Microsoft Teams or through some sort of electronic medium. So it's a very, very different world today. Yeah, very different world today. And how are you adjusting to that? Well, uh, it, it's been, you know, we've had coaching clients, probably 10% of our work has been electronic via email, via uh, uh, Zoom, via phone calls, and 90% has been face to face. Well, now it's totally reversed. It's like 100% is this way. And it's been fairly easy because we have about uh, 30 client systems, 30 client organizations we work with. So I've talked with 20 of the CEOs of those businesses in the past uh, month and talked with a number of their senior teams and people. So we've been doing some coaching, some one-on-one -on -one work. So it, the adjustment's actually been fairly smooth. It's just been um, uh, costly for our travel agent and for some of our admin staff. Dusty, for people who are wondering, you know, they just tuned in and they're like, Dusty Stobbs, never heard of him. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about you. We know that you wrote three books. I know that you founded your company in 1989. Tell, tell, tell our listeners and people who are viewing us on YouTube or anywhere else, who, who is Dusty Stop? Well, that's a great question, Sam. I, I would say that the purpose of Stop Leadership International, of EQIQ leadership, is really liberating the purpose the passion and the power of individuals, teams, and organizations. We have spent, uh, I've spent four decades of my life helping individuals as a therapist, as a coach, as a consultant, uh, as an author, as a keynote speaker, uh, to really step into their power, to claim their power, to really begin to use emotional intelligence to multiply their effective intelligence, IQ. So EQ empowers IQ. And we see everybody as a leader in potential and that it's a matter of being able to step up to your power. You can be the most junior person on a team. You could be starting your own organization. You could be an employee for a multinational big organization. You could be working for yourself out of your home. The key is that you know what empowers you. You know what disempowers you. You can connect with your passion you really know a sense of purpose and you're in service to that. And when that happens, you begin to then acquire the tools. So all the tools in the world won't help you if you don't know who you are, what really matters most and what you're most passionate about. So uh, Dusty, you, you founded your company in 1989. I mean, 31 years. I mean, that's a great accomplishment. First of all, congratulations. What made you, Thank you. What made you do that? Well, I, I was in private practice as a marital and family therapist, um, and I got an offer to go work for a consulting firm. So over a period of months, I, I shut my practice down and I moved to a place called Farr Behavioral Sciences, which was a behavioral sciences consulting firm. And Jim Farr, James Noble Farr, was a genius. Uh, I loved working with him. I worked with him for five years. I became the director of leadership development over the last three years and an officer in the company. And uh, uh, I found that our clients kept asking us for things that I had to struggle with my boss, Jim, and with the organization to make happen. And finally, I decided it'd be easier if I could do it on my own. So I gave notice 
left for our associates and, and founded Staub Leadership International under the umbrella of EQIQ Leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason it was Staub Leadership International is because most people didn't understand EQ back then. Back in 1989, emotional intelligence was a foreign topic for most senior executives. And uh, now we've relaunched it as EQIQ Leadership. Uh, that's the website to help people really understand because we believe now people are ready to understand that without emotional intelligence, it's like having a great operating system, a supercomputer, that's the IQ. But if you have really, forgive my language, shitty programming, mm -hmm. or you have poor programming, or you have the wrong program, you're gonna produce the wrong answers faster than anybody else every time. So it's a matter of changing the software, the emotional intelligence that you have, so that you can make the most of the IQ that you do have. And the same thing's true with your team, your organization, people, and relating to your client systems. What else people need to know about emotional intelligence? Because there's a lot of people who might be listening to this and they're like, never heard of this term called emotional intelligence. Well, emotional intelligence um, was uh, uh, Daniel Goleman uh, actually wrote a book almost, almost 30 years ago, which he, looked, he took trait theory, which was a leadership uh, understanding of different traits made for, for good leaders. It's an incomplete theory. And he, he began to realize that those people that had self-control, those people that could read and understand other people, those people that had these so-called soft skills were actually being more productive and more effective than people who just brought pure intelligence to the table. And so he coined the term emotional intelligence or EQ, and it stands for emotional quotient. And your emotional intelligence is based on four fundamental, there's 17 competencies, but to keep it real simple, it's based on self-awareness. Are you accurately self-aware? Do you know your strengths? Do you know your weaknesses? Do you know how you turn people on, turn people off? Second, if you know and you're self-aware, can you, do you have self-mastery? Can you control yourself? Can you change your behavior to match your insight? Third, can you read and understand other people, different situations, diverse groups, diverse audiences? Do you understand the difference between one generation and the next? Can you read the situation? Can you read the person? And fourth, relationship mastery. Can you change your way of relating to be more effective based on the insights you have into other people? So those four really form the core of emotional intelligence. Now I've added a fifth element, which I believe is courage. Without courage, you won't be accurately self-aware. You won't change your behavior. You won't be able to read and understand other people because you'll be defending and you won't be able to change your way of relating or connecting so you can be more effective. So I think yeah. courage is absolutely essential and there are at least seven key acts of courage. Uh, seven key acts of courage. Would you mind explaining that? Yeah, I, I gave a TEDx talk uh, a couple of years back. Um, and I gotta tell you that before you say that, you know, that was a great talk. And, you know, congratulations for you for being, you know, you're showing your vulnerable, you know, being vulnerable in front of a whole bunch of people and telling us about your whole story. That's, that's, that's great. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. That, that was great TEDx talk. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. I, I've gotten a lot of people tell me that it's helped change their relationship with their father or their mother or a brother or a sister um, or a spouse or ex-spouse. Um, the, for me, the, the, the birth of the seven acts of courage was in the death. I was working in the VA hospital at the time as a psychological intern. And one of the clients I was working with was dying of esophageal cancer. And I was with him at his bedside with his wife and daughter and the duty nurse when he took his last breath. And that was a transformative moment for me. I was a young man, 28, going on 29. And I realized that I had been blaming my father for a lot of things. Uh, I was an army brat, uh, father, career, military man, 26 years. And I was angry and defensive. You couldn't give me criticism. And yet I would be glad to tell you what was wrong with you. Uh, so I, I uh, uh, as one, one colleague said to me, the few of us that actually like you, like you in spite of all your attempts to get us to like you by proving how smart you are. Um, and so uh, what that death did was it opened me up to realize that 
life was very precious. It was very short. Someday I was going to die. Someday that would be my father. And the way I was living was not who I wished to be. So I made a commitment. And it took seven key acts of courage. First was the courage to dream that I could have a different kind of relationship with my father. And then the courage to express that, to put it out there into the world. The second was the courage to see current reality. What I was doing to contribute to the problem, my piece of it, my way of reacting to just the way my father was. The third act was the courage to confront, to confront myself and to also confront my father without being angry because we would yell at each other, but that's not confrontation, that's dumping. Confrontation is when you can have a courageous conversation before you're angry, before you're upset, and you can talk with respect to the other person. The fourth act is the courage to be confronted, to listen non-defensively, even when the other person isn't doing it well. And my father didn't do it well. He tended to yell and use pejoratives and, and language that I won't repeat here. Uh, and I had to learn to take that and understand his intent was trying to communicate something to me underneath all that and dig deeper. The fifth act was the courage to learn and grow, to learn a new way of being, a new way of handling conflict, a new way of dealing with anger, a new way of, of managing my own emotions. It had to do also with giving up the need to be right. I'm a recovering rightaholic. Uh, I come by it honestly. Um, the sixth act is the courage to be vulnerable and open. And that's what the TEDx talk was, was that exercise in vulnerability and openness. What in the heck did I think I had to defend anyway? It was just being my heart, being myself. Yeah. And uh, I find a lot of people have trouble with that. And, and vulnerability is real, real power when we open it. And the last one, the seventh, was the, act, the courage to take action. But the action was now informed by the prior six acts of courage. So the actions I took were much wiser because of those other six acts of courage. And, you know... Um... So one of one of the things you said in, in your TEDx talk that every time you and your father get got upset or you got upset and you got heated, you started walking. Oh yeah, <laughs> you must have done a lot of walking at that time. <laughs> oh, I did. I I I made a commitment that I was no longer going to yell or be disrespectful. And when I started to lose my temper, I would just walk away. And they lived on a golf course, uh, Gates Four at that time, and I'd walk around the golf course and come back and. So the first time I did that, my father said, where'd you go, you damn coward? So I walked around the golf course again. I got a lot of exercise. And it taught me about how to take space to think about what I wanted to do. And remember, my purpose was I wanted to connect with my father, to appreciate him, and to love him regardless of how he treated me so that I could feel free. So it was about me. It wasn't really about him. It was about me respecting me, me loving me, me taking care of me. And the funny thing was, I found that when I got free and I no longer reacted to it, which took about nine months, about a year later, my father changed. And he began to talk to me and he began to engage with me in a very different way. And I came to the conclusion that when we change at heart, when we truly change at heart, no one else can continue to act the way they have for more than another two or three years. <laughs> if we can stick with it, the world around us has to accommodate us. So that's the power we all have. And that's the power most people don't realize they do that. And, and then you and your father became best friends, um, which, which, is, which was a good you know, end to the story on that one. Yeah, I had from age 32 to age 42, I had the father I always wanted because I became the man I wanted to be. And uh, he died suddenly of massive heart attack uh, when I was 42 years old. And I was sitting on the plane flying home in tears. They weren't tears so much of sorrow, they were tears of gratitude that I'd had such a great friend, I'd had such a great father, and that I'd had the courage to totally change my relationship with him. And I was just, I was grateful. You know, what, what leads okay. me to believing one thing, uh, Dusty, I'm sorry to interrupt you, that in order for us, you know, for us to see a better world or for us to see people change, we must change ourselves first. And, and that's, what, that's what you were saying over there. Uh, what, do you think I'm uh, translating it right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If, if the biggest problem most people make is they think they have to change their spouse, they have to change their boss, they have to change their colleagues. The real challenge, the only place we really have power is to change ourselves. 
So if I'm self-aware, I have the power to change myself. I can read other people. I start understanding people are different. I also see where the similarities are. And I have the courage to change my way of relating and connecting based on who I'm dealing with. Boy, that becomes very, very powerful. It requires all seven acts of courage to do it though, to do it well. And that's the piece that was missing in uh, emotional intelligence and in the emotional intelligence circles. They don't talk enough about courage. And when they do, they don't break it down into distinct acts. It's like this monolithic structure, which is just, just too big for most people. So, you know, I want to ask you a question. If, if you go to a, a business or an entrepreneur or somebody who has achieved a lot of stuff, right, or, you know, has gone through the, you know, within time and everything, and then they're like, well, why do I need a consultant? What do you do? What do yeah. you tell somebody like that? Well, I, I say that EQ, IQ, leadership, Stop Leadership International is not for everybody. We're only for those people that truly want to be their absolute best, those that have the courage to be more vulnerable and open, and they realize that there's always a, another edge, another place to, to grow. And the very best athletes, in my experience, the very best athletes, the very best performers, the very best leaders are always hungry to learn how to be better. They realize that, that there's, there's no real perfection it's just a matter of continuous improvement, continuous learning. So if someone says, well, I don't need you, I said, that's fine. You're doing really well. Now, if you want to take it to something truly great, I'd be glad to work with you and you don't need it. And it's just up to you. And I find that, that probably 20% of our clients bring us in because they want to be great. And 80% bring us in because they're in great pain and now they need help. So the 20% that see that they could be even better, even though things are really good. Those are the ones that are a delight really to work with uh, because you're not doing recovery. You're really helping build on strengths and taking them to the next level. And the paradox is when we work with organizations that are in serious trouble, we try to find the strengths they have to build on, to leverage, and then address the top one or two issues that are getting in their way. And that requires good diagnosis, good tools, and it requires really courageous leadership on the part of the senior leaders of the organization. And not all, not all organizations, many organizations don't have that kind of courage or that kind of heart. Gotcha. Um, what, what makes somebody, uh, you know, because, because sometimes entrepreneurs are a different breed, right? They, they don't want to, they, they are not open to criticism. They, uh, they don't want to hear that they're wrong or what they've been doing is total bogus or BS, right? And, and, and it breaks and brings a lot of challenges. And sometimes people are like, why do I need a coach? Why do I need a mentor? Why do I need a consultant to tell me what I'm doing? Heck, I grew this thing from nothing, you know? Yep. And, and the ego comes in, a lot of pride comes in and stuff. People who are, there might be somebody who's listening to this and they might be like, do I really need a consultant? You know what? Some things are not working for me, but my pride will not allow me to get someone to help me. Because the biggest thing is somebody, you know, I read somewhere, if, if it was three things that you could say, I'm sorry, I love you, and I need help. Which one will it be? And it was a poll and everybody, 98% of the people said, I need help. You know, people can say, I love you. People can say, I'm sorry. But saying I need help is, is yeah. very, very difficult for, for human beings in general, especially at time we yeah. live. So yeah. how do you tackle that? That's a great question. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to look at it. Uh, just my short answer would be this. I, I say to somebody, the, the, the courage to be vulnerable and open, to admit that you need help, to admit that you don't know everything, to admit that... Um, you could use some coaching or some support is one of the biggest issues for many, many leaders because there is a lot of ego involved. However, uh, I, I, I often will tell a story, a uh, true story of an executive I worked with. I'll, I'll have to change a few things to protect the guilty here. Uh, it was less than a $500 million business, more than a hundred million dollar business. It was based in the, in the um, Southern part of the country. And this was a CEO who had grown the business, uh, was the son of a founder, had done really, really, really well. However, he had a revolving door at the top. 
he had talented people that were relieving every two or three years, which was expensive. It was costing two or three million dollars a year just to, to replace people. And the feedback he got, he got was that he wouldn't listen to criticism. He wouldn't take in feedback. It had to be his way, his way or the highway. And um, when he came through a, a three-day intensive program we have, uh, I was sharing his feedback. He got very angry. He said, people tell me I have no integrity. And I said, no. I said, what they're telling you is that you won't listen to anybody else, and that damages your integrity. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, when you give feedback to somebody and they get defensive and won't listen to you, do you respect them more or less? He said, well, less. I said, so guess what? When someone's trying to tell you something and you won't listen, they respect you. And he said, less. I said, yeah. So here's the question. You're being successful. Would you like to be more respected or less respected? It's up to you. He said, I want to be more respected. I said, great, here's what you got to do. For the next six months, you need to be asking people to hurt your feelings. And then you have to go, oh, that really hurts. Thank you. Tell me more. <laughs> and he, he laughed and he said, oh, I think I can do that. It's gonna, it's gonna, that sucks. I said, yeah. After the first three or four months, it'll get easier. And at first, people won't trust you. So you're going to have to reward people for hurting your feelings. He did that. And at the end of six months, he had actually increased performance of the organization by 20% because he was building on ideas. People turned on because before it was only as smart as he was. Now he was leveraging and multiplying the effective intelligence of his organization. And that was all about how he applied himself and how he listened on defensively to ideas. So I say, if you want to multiply and, and make sure you're not leaving money on the table, if you want to be absolutely your best, you need to be able to not let your ego run you let your higher sense of purpose. Uh, my father had a, a term I really liked. He said, um, I came home from, from, uh, uh, from work one day, I visit my family, and my dad said, uh, he got out of the military and started a business. He said, son, these damn civilians. And I said, dad, what do these damn civilians do now? He said, son, they do what they feel like doing. They don't do what they really need to do. If they were in the military, we'd shoot them. I said, <laughs> I said he said, they're not pros. I said, dad, what makes a pro? He said, a pro is somebody who does what is necessary, regardless of how they feel. An amateur is somebody who does what they feel and avoids doing what is absolutely necessary. Oh, I love so that. I, I said, would you rather be a pro or an amateur? And we've got a lot of amateur leaders who have been successful in terms of money, but they're not as successful as they could be. And it also in their personal life, in their family life, they also have issues. So that courage to be vulnerable, that courage to be open, that courage to let the ego go is really essential to love relationships, to healthy kids and healthy families, and to really vibrant, healthy businesses. That's true. Uh, people who are, you know, they feel, you know, pain at work, difficulty at work, or they just you know, leaders, I mean, you know, when things get like that, especially, you know, like, like the one executive, you, like uh, CEO you talked about. And just work sometimes becomes not so fun. I mean, why, why does that happen usually at work, workplaces? Well, the, there is a, a term that's starting to be used called positive emotional work environment. That was something you never would have heard of five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. When I started the business, that was a positive emotional work environment. That's a BS. Positive emotional work environment is where people walk in and they feel valued. They feel heard. They feel respected. They feel received. Um, and when you have that, you get high levels of engagement. And uh, the Gallup organization has now gotten lots of information from thousands of organizations that the higher the level of engagement, the higher the level of quality, of profitability, of productivity, of engagement, lower cost structures, et cetera. So the engagement level is really high. And everybody thinks I want high engagement. But engagement is a symptom. It's an outcome of doing other things. You can't have high engagement unless you have real inclusivity in listening to people, unless you have power questions to really get to the heart of the matter, unless you use interactive listening to build on ideas, unless you know how to use yes and 
and, and use improvisational work to help build on ingenuity and creativity within an organization. So there's a whole set of processes and tools that go into building that sense of engagement. And first is, do you value your people? Do you treat them with respect? Do they feel that you care about them? And what level of psychological safety have you created in the work environment? And the Gallup uh, organization is starting to look at this, but Google, which has very, very bright people, they found the highest performing teams, the only differentiator between them and the other teams at Google was the leaders that created a deep sense of psychological safety so people could feel vulnerable. They could open up, they could share ideas, they could build on ideas, they could correct, they could share their mistakes and learn from them. So all that goes into making engagement happen. Gotcha. Now, um, and, and is that one of the ways you build strong teams by uh, everything you just said? Yeah, well, you, you build strong teams. First is, I believe everybody wants to do, do the best they can, and they're doing that based on how they got things figured out. So first of all, give everybody positive intent. Second, assume positive intent. Second, and say, our job is to help figure it out better. If we figure it out better, given that we all want to do our very best, we'll do better. So the key is walking into a room as a consultant, as a coach, as a trainer, as, or, or doing it via a Zoom, is creating that sense of psychological safety. This is a safe zone, a place where we can explore ideas, we can talk, we can look at issues, and we can build that sense of high level trust. And that trust is based on psychological safety and on an experience of how I'm gonna be treated when I make a mistake, how I'm gonna be treated when I offer a half-baked idea, how I'm gonna be treated when I have a concern or I express a fear. So, uh, or give you an idea. So it's really building on those. So we built the organization through building high performance teamwork in, in organizations and doing that requires really having effective wholehearted leading. So we work with the leaders individually through coaching. We work with the teams to build team agreements, which are rules of the road or the military would say rules of engagement of each other. Um, and having experiences of trust building. And we also have tools for innovation, uh, bottom line innovation work that we do, team-based creativity. And when teams get to experience doing things together and coming up with better answers and feeling better about it, they get excited. Um, and we also have certain disciplines like start the meeting on time, end on time, or early, <laughs> never go over. Uh, and so there are structures for communicating, for problem solving, for building collaboration, whole sets of tools and things we've developed over the years. The key is getting people to first feel safe and begin to open up and to work on substantive issues. So when we work with an organization, we don't say, what are 101 uses for a brick? We say, what are 15 different ways to look at this that you've not looked at before? What are 10 different ways to solve this they would be outside the norm for you. So we're working with substantive issues, with real time, real issues. And one of the things we found, Sam, is that uh, when we work with people this way, using a process we call divide and empower, breaking into subgroups to work certain issues, come back, using multi-voting, which is a total quality tool, using uh, intent behavior result, which is communication process we have, some of our problem solving tools and creativity tools, that we're able to help organizations get twice as much done in the same amount of time. Gotcha. For high performing organizations, we get twice as much done in half the amount of time. So we quadruple effectiveness. In average organizations, we double effectiveness. That, that's, that's been our experience so far. Uh, you know, during these times, especially like, you know, with COVID, uh, things have maybe come down a little bit, but you know, for, for, for early part of, you know, uh, when, when all this happened, started in March, there was utter chaos and, and there's still chaos and, and people are concerned about, you know, uh, there's a lot of people now working at, uh, at the office, people are working from home, the, the, the CEOs, the leaders, the, the supervisors have to trust their employees that they're, you know, getting the work done, the work effectiveness to getting done at home and everything. What, what kind of message will you have for leaders who are having a hard time trusting their employees, uh, you know, 
what kind of message will you will you give you know some of them because i'm sure well, there's a lot of struggling with this yeah well the 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 leaders who are doing the best job of of uh, our client systems are the ones where they are calling in and checking in with their direct reports and sometimes one or two levels below they're just calling and checking in to see how people are doing personally there's a sense of personal care there's a sense of of uh, connectivity. One of our, our best client organizations and I, I, uh, is an organization, I have permission to share this, is Bialik Environments. And their executive committee meets every morning to talk about where things are in the business, what's going on with clients, what's happening, how they're managing, what their scenarios are. And they, but the first question they always ask is, how are you doing? They ask each other, how are you doing? How's your family? and then they talk about the business. Then each of those executive committee members call their managers, and the first thing they question, how are you doing? How's your family? They check in to make sure they, they feel supported. Then they fill them in on what's going on, and they ask about how their teams are doing. Then the managers call their direct reports. And the president, uh, Jeremy Levitt, and Joan Bialik, the CEO, will actually call down two or three levels below to check on people periodically. So there's this sense of caring, there's this sense of almost, uh, you're part of this family. Um, that has led to tremendous loyalty, tremendous engagement. I have other clients that are doing things similar. Uh, then I have a client or two where I've had people call me saying that their boss has never checked in with them, never asked how they're doing. And the other practice that I think is important besides that personal connectivity is keeping people informed. Here's where we understand is, here's where the business is, here's what's going on, here's what we're, we're thinking we need to do, here's what we're doing, here's why. And so you communicate decisions with some of the why and information behind it so people are informed. And unfortunately, some of our clients are having to uh, have extended layoffs, um, they've cut salaries, and even after cutting salaries, some of the disappointment is they've had to actually lay some folks off. Um, and make sure they're communicating with everybody in an open, honest, direct, transparent manner really seems to help. So those two things, that personal connection, that transparency and openness and communication, and then just that sense of caring that, that we're in this together and we're doing the best we can that we're going to survive it. That, yeah. that's, that's really a key, key pieces. That, that's one of the key pieces. Uh, Dusty, let's talk about you a little bit back again. Uh, you've written three books, okay? Tell us a little bit about like, you know, one, you know, each book. So the heart of leadership, when you, when did you write that one? All right. Uh, the heart of leadership is this book right here. Okay. And that was written, that came out in hardback. Executive Excellence was the uh, publisher at the time. It came out in uh, 1994. And uh, it's in its eighth edition now. And it looks at leadership from a holistic framework. It looks at leadership from a holistic framework that says there's seven key dimensions to leadership. Um, and very quickly, the heart of leadership is purpose. Uh, it's your core why. I've been talking about that since, since 1994. Uh, Simon Sinek did a TED, TED talk on the golden circle. He talked about the core why, which has had millions of views. Well, we've been doing that since 1994, really focusing on why you exist. Great companies focus on their why, average companies focus on what they do and how they do it. Um, the next is vision. It's not enough to have your purpose. Where you wanna take this vision over the next year or two or three, or that's directional, aspirational. Then it takes courage because you won't live your purpose and you won't move towards your vision without courage. And it takes at least seven key acts of courage. Where are you strongest? Where are you weakest? So we get into the personal mastery, mastery of leadership and so forth. Now that's not enough to have purpose, vision and courage. There are four chambers, we call it the heart, the living heart of leadership is you gotta have the right competency. You gotta have the right strategic know-how, the right technical know-how. That's the what to do and how to do it. Competency, you gotta have integrity that people will trust you that you stand behind your brand, that you'll do what you say, um, that you're willing to be confronted, that you're gonna tell the truth. That's all the integrity piece. Then there's intimacy. How well do you connect with other people? How much insight do you have? How much awareness do you have? 
How easy is it to do business with you? How approachable are you as a business, as an individual, et cetera? And then passion, which is the realm of commitment, can do and will do. If you don't treat people well in intimacy, you'll never get their passion. With the greatest passion, but without competency, you can go take a team or company right off a cliff. Without integrity, you ruin your brand, you destroy your brand, nobody trusts you. And that's happened to a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. And they compromise their brand. Volkswagen compromised their brand with the emissions scandal, right? Uh, uh, Wells Fargo compromised its brand uh, with uh, selling the uh, services that clients didn't ask for. It's cost them billions of dollars. So when you compromise your brand, this recovery is huge and sometimes you can't recover. So those seven dimensions, and we'll look at an organization, we look at a leader and say, where are you strongest here? Where do you most need to develop? Which act of courage is your greatest strength? Which one is your, your Achilles heel? And so we have a comprehensive framework for understanding leadership. My second book that came out in 1996 was this little book called The Seven Acts of Courage. And the seven acts of courage, bold leadership for a whole hearted life. So, so I got to tell you about this. The seven acts of courage. Uh, someone gave me that as a, as a gift about a month ago. I didn't even have no idea who you were at that time. And, ah. and I saw that yesterday. I'm like, you know what? I need to read this book. And I look at the author. I'm like, oh, it's dusty. I'm going to have a book. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's uh, my legal name, Robert E. Staub II. Um, Everybody knows me as Dusty. That book was where I, I really fleshed out courage into the key seven acts. And there's a chapter on each act of courage. Uh, the first chapter is why courage matters. The last chapter is putting it all together. Uh, so there's nine chapters. And it's, it's the easiest read. It's the shortest read of, of all my books. My third book was with Wayne Gerber, which you mentioned. Wayne Gerber has been a friend of mine for 47 years now. We wrote a book called Dynamic Focus, Creating Significance and Breaking the Spells of Limitation, which is about change transformation. How do you move beyond change dynamic to true transformation? And we have a five-step process uh, that we talk about how to do it, and that's what that book is all about. And I have a fourth book you didn't mention, which is Courage in the Valley of Death. It's a short, inspirational book. It's just a few lines per page. It's mostly for CEOs, people with short attention spans. And it is uh, meant to be inspirational. It's a summation of what's in this book in very, very short way, trying to inspire people. And then in the appendix, it's got a few tools on how to develop your courage and how to discover your core purpose in life. But the seven acts really fleshes that out and gives you examples, business and personal. And then there's a summary of how to build each act of courage at the end of every chapter. And you have already- so Those are my four- over, over 250 articles in news in the business news journal. And, yes. Uh, yes. If someone wants to find you, uh, I mean, how on on the internet, on social media, where where are you parked at most of the time? Well, uh, uh, one well, the best way to connect is is www.eqiqleadership.com, which okay. is the new website uh, we've launched around EQIQ. They can also go to uh, uh, www.stobleadership.com. Um, and uh, there's also, we have another website called www.theactsofcourage.com. Okay. So the Acts of Courage has some videos and interviews about courage specifically. It's just meant for everybody, for people in junior high, high school, et cetera. Uh, Stop leadership is really business to business. EQIQ is a combination of all that. Uh, so, um, and I'm, I'm going to be doing a deep dive onto change mastery, change, uh, navigating change as possibility, which is going to start next Thursday, the 16th. And on uh, EQIQleadership.com, if you go to the blog section, there's a link to that. So anybody's interested, we are keeping it really small, but we still have some space available if people are interested in a deep dive into dealing with change dynamics. Okay, so, so basically changing things. Yes. So, so I yes. want to ask and that how, change is hard, right? A lot of people yes. might say, well, I've been like this for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years of my life, and now you want me to change. Change is hard. Okay, how can... You know, can you give any tips on how can 
it can be easier to make some changes. You change some stuff you know, with your relationship with your dad and you were at 30 at that time or 28, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but, but you were some, somewhere right about there and your dad changed and he had been like that for almost all his life. So how can, yeah, yeah. How can someone make change easier? Well, that's the million dollar or actually the multi-billion dollar question, right? Uh, uh, and uh, if you can guarantee that people could have change, successful change every time, you, you, you're actually like the US government, you print your own money. <laughs> what, I would say is, what I would say is that it's, it's a complex issue. And I find if I could break it down to its simplest elements, having worked with individuals, families, a couple hundred thousand people and probably about 120 CEOs over the years, I would say that the first is you've got to see the pain point that if you continue down this path, you look at what you're going to get. And if it's not satisfying you, if it's painful, if it's you feel a kind of blah about it, then something's wrong. Uh, where's your passion? Where's your energy? So the first is, if I continue down this path, what's likely to happen? What's happening? Do I feel good about it? Where am I? Second is paint a picture of desired future. Proverbs says, without a vision, the people perish. What's a desired future? Where would you like to be? What would be worthy of your life? Um, and do you know who you are? Do you know what you're in service to? So if you know what you're in service to, you look at how you're acting, where you're going, where you're going to end up, and it doesn't feel joyful, then what's a vision you can paint? From my purpose, knowing where I'm gonna go if I keep going down this path, where I wanna be, and then commit to that vision, commit to that future self you wanna create. And don't lie to yourself, admit all the barriers, all the things that are in your way of, get, of making that change and making that movement and making the commitment anyway. I commit to that. And you create something that uh, Robert Fritz, a great creative thinker, talks about as structural tension. You commit to what you want, you never lie about where you are, you never lie about the barriers, and you keep choosing every day that vision. And what happens is if you stand in that tension, then things start coming to you. Coaches, information, books, data, things start happening because you be, you've committed to this and you have this core intent and the power of intention is when you commit to it and you bring your passion to it, you begin to make the changes. So you have to desire it. You have to choose it. You have to choose it every day. You have to see the consequence of not going down that path. And you have to be honest and tell the truth. And then it requires the, the courage to be vulnerable, ask for help, the courage to confront issues, uh, the courage to be confronted, the courage to learn and grow, and the courage to take action. Very good. Uh, I feel like I've asked you this, or maybe you, you already said this, but why is a coach or mentor so important? And why because is it is difficult? Because it's difficult, Sam. It's, you know, we, we, uh, uh, I've had coaches and mentors all, all through my life who've helped me. Um, uh, a great uh, mentoring is StoryBrand. How do you tell your story? How you, you put your information out there in a way that people can connect? So none of us are experts in everything. So when we want to learn and grow and we're going after something truly worthy, we're going to need help. We can't do it by ourselves. Um, and that's where that courage to be vulnerable uh, comes in. That's where the courage to be confronted. That's where the courage to dream and express it and the courage to, to give up the need to be right comes in. So my ego is just an artifact of personality. And my ego, the question is, are my personal feelings more important than being the best I can be? Is my ego more important than being more effective? Well, if I have a choice between ego and being more effective, I choose more effective. That means I need to sometimes hurt my feelings, invite my feelings to be hurt. I need to be willing to, to listen. So to do that effectively, often a coach, an outside voice to reflect back to us who we really are, what we really want, to challenge us with respect, to help us see our strengths and claim them, and to walk through those difficult moments. And I don't think you can be a good coach unless you've been through those yourself. 
so all the hardships and difficulties in my life and all the losses and um, all the challenges that I've faced and come through have made me more effective as a coach. So I can help guide people down pathways that they might be afraid to go down or they're uncertain of. I've been down those pathways. I can help them. A lot and that's of time, what a good coach. Are. A lot of time people are like, okay, well, maybe I need it. I'll take a coach. I'll get a coach. But then the hurdle is, what do I got to pay that amount of money for a coach? What will the coach do for me after I pay him this much money or I have to pay her that much money? How do people look through that or look, you know, go around that? Well, what would your uh, well, advice be on that? Well, my advice is you get out of life what you put into it. So um, what's the value? Something that's truly free, we tend to devalue. Um, and uh, the, uh, Joni Mitchell wrote a song about uh, a guy playing on the subway. He was playing real good for free, but nobody stopped to listen. You know, uh, and if he'd been in a concert hall, everybody would have been there wrapped. But when it's free and it's accessible, we tend to ignore it. So I would say you get out of uh, value, the value you put in. So the value put in very often is an exchange of money money for talent and time from this coach or this consultant or uh, this uh, advocate who work with you. And what happens is that the, uh, the way I like to do it is, here's the initial fee, and then you, get, you have to be delighted each month when we're working that you feel like you're getting value before you pay anything else. So there's an initial assessment and workup, and then the coaching process can take six months to nine months, sometimes longer, usually, within nine months, you're, you're in a really good place. That coaching process is something people pay for on a monthly basis, and they have to be delighted. There has to be an ongoing dialogue and a real sense that this is, this is valuable, that I'm getting more from the coaching than I'm actually paying for. Gotcha. I've had some clients say, you should charge me more. <laughs> that, I always know I'm being really successful when, when I have somebody say, you should actually charge me more. So if someone wants to find you, they can find you on eqiq.com or stopleadership.com, S-T-A-U-B, leadership.com. And also, yes. you know, what social medias are you usually on? Or do you do any social media? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, on, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, also on uh, Instagram and Facebook. And I find, I find out I really like Instagram a lot because I've got it on my phone and I can... I can uh, attack that. I've got about, uh, oh, I think 14,000 people now on LinkedIn that are, are connected with me. And on Instagram, it's only about 1,200 folks. So, so uh, Instagram is uh, uh, Dusty, what is, it? what is your handle on Instagram? Dust, dusty underscore stop. Okay. And there's also a link, to, there's also a Instagram on EQIQ Leadership. Okay. So they can they can join on on EQIQ leadership or Dusty underscore Staub, um, and the EQIQ it's EQIQleadership.com. They have to put in the leadership to get. Oh, EQIQleadership.com and on and on LinkedIn you're Dusty Staub. Yeah, Dusty underscore Staub, and also there's EQIQ leadership on on uh, on LinkedIn it's Dusty Staub, right? Perfect. Now, you know, I, I like to you know we are coming towards the end of our. Uh, you know, our, our interview. And, and I've learned a lot from you uh, just in this brief 50 minutes that we've been talking, right? And, and I'm hoping that a lot of people got, uh, got a lot of uh, uh, value out of it. So you live, you live in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I go over there twice a year. This year will be a little different because uh, we, we, we missed April because due to, uh, uh, you know, COVID. We don't know if October is really going to happen or not, you know, and um, and it's and it's challenging. And I mean, I love going to you know, I love going to North Carolina. I just love all the trees, the scenery. You know, it's, a lot of people might you know who have not gone over there, it's, especially from the the drive from because I always land in Raleigh, and and I take the drive to High Point, and it's a, it's an amazing drive, and uh, and I I mean you know I feel like I can breathe. You know, while I'm while I'm uh, over there, coming from Houston, you know, bigger city, just uh, just so much, so much nice, so much nature out there, so much uh, out there. So I I'm sure you enjoy living over there. Tell us your day to day. 
what is what is what is a day in Dusty Staub's life look like? Since COVID, <laughs> uh, a day since COVID first. Yeah, did yeah yeah. So so a day to day for me is I get up, uh, I have a, a cup of coffee, I sit on the back deck, uh, I say some prayers. Uh, there's a lot of people I'm praying for right now and for our world. Uh, then I go and do about an hour and a half of yoga, intense yoga. I've been doing yoga for 37 years now. Um, and uh, that keeps me tuned and strong and flexible and open. Uh, then I get on the phone and I'm talking to people. I'm doing uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, connections. I'm doing Zoom calls. This is my third call this morning. Uh, a third connection, working with clients and coaching and doing interviews. Uh, then I write in the afternoon. Then I'll go for a long walk because we're on a 60 acre farm here. So I've got lots of land to, to walk around on. And in the afternoon, late evening, I'm doing some more uh, phone calls, some more coaching. I'm doing some more writing. I'm working on two new books uh, in addition to the, the first four. Um, and uh, have a nice dinner, make dinner for for my wife and I, we talk. Sometimes we will watch TV. Sometimes we will go for a long walk around the land. Sometimes we both are working. Uh, so that's that's kind of a typical day right now. What time do you wake up usually? Uh, usually around seven. Seven. Okay. Uh, Dusty, yeah. what, what is your what is your point of view about humility in life? Oh gosh, uh, my point of view is we're only aware of a tiny, tiny bit of the electromagnetic spectrum around us. We're only aware of a tiny, tiny bit of what's going on actually. We can't see most of it, can't feel most of it. And then our way of thinking, our patterns of thinking narrow that down. So we have a tiny, tiny fraction of a tiny, tiny fraction of what's actually going on. So no matter how much we know or no how much we see, there's always so much more. So that should bring a sense of humility. And it's from humility that I'm willing to learn and grow and be willing to be vulnerable and open. Humility to me is strength, not weakness. It's not meekness. It is being humble enough to realize I can learn from anybody. I can grow. It is the antidote to ego. In, in that sense. So I think humility is very, very important. I think it's a real sign of strength and it goes hand in hand with the courage to be vulnerable. Nice. If all your books were destroyed today, let's say from, this is from a hundred years from t today, you, you somehow managed to be, do yoga and be healthy and live another hundred years, but now <laughs> everything is destroyed. All your books are gone. All your articles are gone. This interview has been wiped off the, the internet. And so is everything, right? But you have a pen and a right. paper, the last day, your last day on this world, right? And you have a pen and a paper and you want to leave something for your future generation, your, you know, and for the future world. And this can be three things about how to live, how to conduct life, how to conduct in daily in, in your life, or what is important. It can be anything. What will those three things be, Dusty? It's a great question, Sam. I would say the first is take the time to know who you are, commit to a core sense of purpose and meaning in your life. That's the storm anchor that'll get you through everything. Second, access your heart. Listen to your heart. Your heart is the integrated center and there's an intelligence in the heart that's greater than the intelligence in the brain. It is about connection, collaboration. It's about humility. It is about courage. And courage is really center to everything and understand the different acts of courage. And here they are, I've laid those out. And then I'd say the third thing is that love is the key. Uh, if you're gonna be on your deathbed, you're gonna look back, it's not gonna be all the things you accomplished, it'll be how much did you love? How deeply did you live? How fully did you commit to being your best self? Those would be the things I would say. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about love, a little bit more, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, you don't ask easy questions, Sam. Uh, love is that capacity to put someone else's needs and interests ahead of your own, 
because of your care. When a baby is born, when I held all three of my children, when I look at them, I would give my life for them, for my wife. I'd give my life for her. So love is that capacity to really make others as important or more important than your own well-being at the moment. And it is self-love is the ability to really appreciate yourself, all your flaws, all your imperfections, who you are, and to be at peace with yourself, to know that you care about yourself, you love yourself, that you're going to be imperfect, that you're going to learn, you can improve. You have, from that, you find the courage to step out, you find the courage to listen non-defensively, you have to find the courage to confront issues and challenges. So for me, there's self-love is really central, and you can't love anyone else truly until you know how to love yourself. And when I was a young therapist, I came to this formulation which said, I think most of the problems with people is a chronic lack of self-love, mild, moderate, severe. <laughs> so, so it's learning to love and appreciate ourselves and be at peace with ourselves and then sharing that love with other people. So that's my brief thing on love. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Dusty, you know, people can, you can buy me a gift, you know, with money. You can buy a lot of things with money and, and, and they all appreciate it. But time is such a currency that we don't have a lot of. And for you coming over here and donating your time to, to me, to my podcast, to my listeners, I appreciate it very much. I want to thank you from the bottom yeah. of my heart for, for doing so. It's, it, Sam, it's my pleasure. It's my, my delight. How, how can I get access to your podcast? Uh, well, so my podcast, you can listen to, you, I'm on all podcast pl platform. Uh, it's called Make Shit Happen, okay? And uh, when, when you search it, Make Shit Happen with I, with the, instead of I, it's an asterisk, you can find it. Also, um, I'm on Instagram at Life of Super Sammy Z, uh, and I put, post little tidbits on there. And uh, all these interviews are on video on YouTube at Life of Super Sammy Z. Um, but podcasts where you can listen to just audio is make shit happen. All pod podcast platform. I'm on Apple, Google, any, anywhere you can listen to podcasts. All right. Great. That's beautiful. Well, That's thank you. This, I, you ask great questions. It's been a delight working with you and uh, hopefully we can do another one sometime. Yes, hopefully. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure people will get a great, will get great value and, uh, you know, listen to it and, you know, they should also listen if anyone is still listening, I, I mean, I think I recommend them listen to your TEDx because when I listened to it, it made me think about several things. Very rarely I listen to something and it makes me think. I mean, every time I listen to something or read something, it definitely makes me think. It just doesn't make me think for three, four, five days after. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, your TEDx talk really left an impression on me. And uh, starting from where you were standing at the hospital bed to how your dad was going to go to Notre Dame and, you know, and he went to the military and, you know, till, till, you know, the day he died. And I mean, it was, it was, it was great. So, I mean, I, I mean, I appreciate you sharing that with me, sharing that with the world. Thank you for coming over here, sharing this with the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. It was a pleasure. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.